message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we turn again to the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. I want to look with you at the book of Colossians just for a minute this, today as uh, we, we get ourselves going here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul says, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. We really need to start in verse number 12, where he says, Giving thanks unto the Father, who hath give, made us meet to be partakers with inheritance of the saints in light. Paul says, I'm going to pray and give thanks to God, the Father, because he's, he's the one that's qualified us to be saints and to partake in this inheritance that he has, this wonderful thing that he's doing in his Son, who delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, when he says in verse 13, that the Father has delivered us from the power of darkness, from the authority. He's liberally, literally liberated us from the authority of Satan to run our life and has translated us into the kingdom under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Christ, we have redemption. It's through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. At Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ won the right to transfer your citizenship from the kingdom of darkness to, his, to, to, to the kingdom of God. And it's in Christ at Calvary, the work he did at Calvary, in, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's the basis upon which he gives thanks to the Father. Now I say that to you because in the Bible, those two things go together, thanksgiving and forgiveness. Forgiveness is the basis upon which real, genuine joy and thanksgiving can be had in the life of a believer. It's the emotion that the Bible associates with forgiveness. Uh, in chapter 2 of Colossians, and, and by the way, the book of Colossians has a lot to say about thanksgiving, and it also has a lot to say about forgiveness. Colossians 2, verse 13, he says, And you being dead in the sins and your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, listen, all trespasses. How many? All of them. Past, present, and future. You say, well, why would he forgive me of my future sins? Well, think about it. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, how many of your sins were future? That's right, all of them were. You weren't even a gleam in your daddy's eye or a nightmare in somebody's dreams. You didn't exist. You were way out there in the future, and yet God knew about you, and 2,000 years before you ever became a reality, Jesus Christ died for your sins. All of your sins were future when he died for them, so that when he saved you, he saved you from all of your sins that he died for you. So this idea about Jesus, well, he, he, when, I, when he saved me, he saved me from all my sins up till then, and then I got to do something with the rest of it, that's just a bunch of religious poppycock. That's like the guy said, it's like a, like a sock on a chicken's foot. It just don't work. That dog won't hunt, friend. I'm sorry. Forgiveness is total. It's free, freely given because of the cross work of Christ. It's fully provided for you through the cross work of Christ, and it's forever. It never ends. And it's designed for you, designed in you, to produce joy. Romans chapter number 4 verse that we've looked at many times before, Romans 4, verse number 5, Paul says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth 
righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's what forgiveness is, is to have your sins sent away. The word forgiveness means to send them away. Where does he send them? Verse 5, he says, But to him that worketh not, but, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Him that justifies the ungodly, Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. God took your sin and sent it to the cross. And God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. At Calvary, he who was rich became poor that ye through his poverty might be made rich. I don't know if you ever thought about the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing event. Here's God, God the Son, thought it not Robert to be equal with God, is in the form of God, yet he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant, being made in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and was obedient even to the, unto death, even the death of the cross. He went to Calvary, and he submitted himself to the hatred and the anger and the rejection of man. And if you want to see God in man's hands, you look at the cross and you see the, the handiwork of our rebellion and our unbelief and our rejection of God himself. You see the epitome of our sin, murdering, crucifying, with wicked hands, crucifying the Lord of glory. And in that dastardly display of our deadly disease, you see the grace of God. Because God had, in, in the wisdom of God, when the world by wisdom knew not God, God had a plan that had the princes of this world known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But God's plan was that through that cross work of Jesus Christ, where he takes the weight and the guilt and the load and the ferocity of sin unto himself. It's all demonstrated, and it's paid for. And the Bible says that the, the, that the Lord made his soul an offering for your sin and for my sin. And he completely, he became the just and the justifier. He was just in that the sin debt was paid so that he then might be the one who declares righteous those who trust him. To him that works not, but, him, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Your faith in Christ is counted as though that was your death, because it becomes your death when you trust him, when you identify with him by faith. And Paul says there's a blessedness, there's a joy. David described it of the man whose iniquities are forgiven, sent away to the cross to be dealt with forever and fully, whose sins are covered, completely taken off the record, gone. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Never to be laid to your charge, never to be remembered to you, reattached to you, Never to be held against you again, because you've been fully satisfied. Then when he says blessed, come back to Genesis chapter 30. That word blessed there is, a, is, a, is an interesting word. When it first shows up in the Bible, back here, Genesis chapter number 30, Leah, you remember Rachel and Leah, Jacob's wives, the list of their, their children is in Genesis 30. Verse 13, it says, Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed, blessed, and she called his name Asher, which means happy. When Leah has a little boy, Asher, she says, Blessed am I, happy am I. And I'm so blessed and happy and thrilled to have this boy, I'm going to name him Happy. <laughs> so like a flower child, you know, the moonbeam generation. You see that term blessed, it's not just, oh, I'm just so blessed, it feels so good. It's, it's the joy of having a newborn infant come into your family. 
It's a wonderful thing to see children born. I've got three children, nine grandchildren now. My family tells me they can date when they see this TV program, when I was taped this TV program by telling you how many grandchildren I have. <laughs> I think we're probably through now, so nine's a top number maybe. But anyway, by the way, grandchildren are God's blessings on you for not killing your children. Somebody told me that years ago, and I didn't know it was true until I began to have grandchildren, and boy, I can tell you it is true now. I know it is true. There's a joy in that little infant when he's born. And you know, you look at, you look at them, and some of them are coming, and they go, the faces all squished up, and their head's all pointy, because it's a tough deal to get born. Their skin's all ready, and, and you look at them, and Mama look at them, Dad look at them, and say, ain't he beautiful? And I've been there and looked at them, some of them, and, you know, some of them weren't all that terribly wonderfully beautiful at that moment. And yet you look at them, and they are. There's a joy in having that little baby born into your family that's more than just, woo hoo, -hoo my, my team won the ball game, or woo hoo, -hoo I, I got the promotion, or we won the, the race. There's something that goes down into your inner man, into your soul, and just humbles you and thrills you at the same time. That's the word, that delight that a mom and a dad have over that newborn, or even better, the delight that a grandma and a grandpa has over that grandchild. Blessed. You see, there's a joy that goes down into your soul that just changes you. And the joy of the Lord is your strength, the Bible says. Blessed is the man. The feeling, see, feeling forgiven is that joy that comes from an appreciation of who God has made you in Christ and what God has done for you in Christ. And it's that joy of a new life. Life in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 4 because I want you to see what religion does for you. Genesis chapter 4. You know, you get a lot of substitutes in religion. The lie program of the adversary's main tactic is to counterfeit truth. In Isaiah chapter 14, when Satan, when Lucifer uh, developed his plan of rebellion against God, his plan was that he was going to be like the Most High God. He was going to become the preeminent person of the universe by being like the preeminent person. He was going to counterfeit what God was doing. The lie program has always sought to counterfeit the truth. And so when you have religion, it's going to try to counterfeit the joy that forgiveness is supposed to bring, like it has a counterfeit forgiveness, all based upon what you do, which never gets you anywhere, does it? Because <laughs> what you do is you fail, and then you need more forgiveness. And then you wonder, well, why do, if I'm forgiven, why do I keep doing this? Well, I must not be forgiven because I keep doing it. And it's just that round, vicious circle down into the slew of despond. Religion is classified for you in Genesis chapter 4. The first chapters of the Bible give you the template upon which all of human life operates. Genesis 3, you see how sin attacks. You see the immediate defense mechanisms that the old sin nature authors uh, to try to cover up your sin and try to immobilize you from dealing successfully with your failures. Genesis 4, you, you, you see the application of Operation Fig Leaf that comes out of Adam and Eve in the garden. And you see what religion does. Now, religion has two extremes. One, you have formalism, and the other, you have fanaticism. In formalism, you have... A person brought into humility and, and into contrition through rites, rituals, ceremonies that they perform. You've been in church buildings, the architecture of that building, the, the, the stunning impressiveness of the architecture just makes you feel small and humble. The grandeur of the theater, of the, of the ceremonies and the pomp makes you feel humble. 
the awe of formalism. Then on the other side, you go way the other way, and you have people jumping and hooting and dancing in the, in the aisles and jitterbug Jesus and, and all that. So you have the two extremes. But it's all, produ it's all designed to produce joy, thanksgiving, hum humility that comes, that, that humbling, that, that humbling that you experience when you held that new life, that little baby down in your soul. But it's all, a, it's all a lie. Now watch it, Genesis 4. And Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Now, what she thought happened, what she and Adam thought happened, was in Genesis 3.15, when God said the seed of the woman is going to destroy the seed of the serpent. God's going to give the woman a redeemer, and through the woman a redeemer is going to come. When she had Cain, she thought, here's God's man. Here's the kid that's going to be the Redeemer. He's going to destroy the adversary and restore us back to the garden. And she again bare her brother, Abel. So now she has another kid. By the way, Adam and Eve had a bunch of kids. Uh, chapter 5, verse number 3 said, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his image. After his image, he, and, and called him uh, his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he begat Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. So he's having, they're having children right along, and the children are having children, so population is growing. But if you had Cain, and then it'd be a year later to have Adam, have Abel, in other words, there's, there's some time in the text here that isn't necessarily just recognized instantly there. When Abel came along, Abel didn't get much attention. He's a, a Cain is a, he, he, uh, Abel's a keeper of sheep. He sort of go out and tend to the sheep in the field. Boy, don't, don't stay home, go out there. Cain is a tiller of the ground. Cain, Adam takes Cain into, into business with him. That's, Cain's, that's Adam's business. He's a farmer. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also, also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Now, notice that these two boys know when to come in the process of time. They know when to come. They know where to, bring the, where to come. And they know what to bring. They'd heard the story from their dad and their mom about when they sinned, God was going to put them out of the garden, and they were supposed to die. And instead of them dying, God took an innocent animal. Adam and Eve, man, were the only creatures God made that didn't have their own clothing. All the animals had skins. They had clothing. Adam and Eve didn't. Adam and Eve were given a garment from God, a garment of light, that multicolored garment, the many coat of many colors. Uh, it's called in, uh, when, when Jacob gave it to, uh, uh, to, jo uh, to Joseph. And that coat of many colors, that garment of light, that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he walked in the cool of the day with him, he had in order that man was identified as God's representative. He had God's uniform on. But when he sinned, he lost that. And so God took an innocent animal, slew it, shed its blood, and made a covering. Now you and I know what that is in type and picture. But Adam and Eve understood that God provided them a covering through the shedding of, of innocent blood. They knew that there was a place where the cherubim were, where the, tree, the way of the tree of life. They knew, and they communicated all of this to their boys. And so Cain comes and Abel come. Cain brings the fruit of the ground. Cain brought what he had produced out of the earth. Abel brought the blood of a lamb. Now, one is bringing what God had done. One is do it, repeating what his daddy had done. They come. God has respect, verse 4. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. God accepted Abel's. The fire fell, consumed it. Cain's is nothing. Cain's big day, his coronation day, his confirmation day, the day he thought he was going to, they all bring him, think he's going to be exalted as the Redeemer, fell flat. Your performance never going to get you there. I want you to see what happened. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. <laughs> now that doesn't mean his face fell off of his, you know, 
head. That means he went from... He turned his smile upside down, made a frown. You know what he got? He got the bitterness and the disillusionment uh, and the despair of guilt and the depression associated with... He got the, the results of sin unforgiven. When you trust what you do as good as it could be, and everyone can agree with you that it's great, if it's not what God requires, religion just leads to guilt and depression. The way of feelings always leads to destruction. When you live out of an understanding of the identity God gives you in Christ, based on who you are in Christ, and you, 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 you accept and you appropriate by faith who God says you are, then there's joy and blessedness. When you live out of appreciating and, and trusting what you're doing, there's always going to be defeat. The Christian life is designed to be a life of growth. It's life. First you get life, and then that life transforms you. It changes you. People get the cart before the horse. They want to change. You need to get life first. Folks called me recently and they said, well, we, we have a, a, young, a young member of our, of our family who's gotten involved in drugs, gotten involved in addictive uh, substances, and they're having this problem, that problem. I said, can you help? Can you help us change, get, get some change? I said, no, change isn't what he needs. <laughs> You can change, you can send her to rehab center and change the conduct, but change isn't what he needs. He needs life. And if you get life, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you have life, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. When you have life, life will change. First faith, then transformation. First life, then change. That's the way the Christian life is. We have life in Christ, then we're to grow, and it transforms us. The problem is most of us get stymied with that. Come with me to Second Peter chapter 1. We get stymied with the growth process. Second Peter chapter 1. We want to grow. We want to change. But we just never see, seem to mature. We don't seem to progress. We'll be like Paul. To will is present with me, but how to perform, I find not. What keeps believers from growing? What keeps the victory that God gives us in Christ from being appropriated into our life. Peter gives a very clear answer to that. This is not a problem that just takes place in Paul's epistles. It takes place in the Hebrew epistles too. And 2 Peter 1, Peter gives a very clear answer. 2 Peter 1 verse 5, he says to, to these believers, he says, Beside this, give all diligence, add, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to brother, godliness brotherly love, and to brotherly love charity. Grow. Add these things. Grow in your experience. Because if you add these things into your life, if these things be in you and abound, that you may be, that they, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, the guy that isn't growing spiritually and maturing spiritually, is blind and cannot see afar off. Why? Having forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You see, the problem when people aren't making spiritual progress, when you aren't being transformed, when you aren't growing, if you're really saved and you have life, the thing that stymies your, 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 your progress in the Christian life is to forget that you've already been purged from your old sins. Forgetting that one thing stops spiritual growth and transformation dead in its tracks. That liberating truth 
that you've been cleansed and forgiven from your sins, redeemed and forgiven. When you forget that, he says, you become blind. You can't see far. When you can't see far off, you become nearsighted. You cannot see things up close. All you can see is things yourself and everything about you and what you're doing. And life becomes about you. It becomes about your struggles and your, your, your weaknesses and, and, and your guilt and your shame and your fears and your frustrations and everything is you. And you become blind to what God's done for you and you forget about what God's doing in your life, what Christ has accomplished. And everything is, it, it revolves around you. Forgetting about being forgiven. Listen, forgiveness is the key to growth and transformation in Christ Jesus. And when you step out on that foundation uh, by faith of, of who God has made you in Christ, forgiven you of all your trespasses, and you rest in that truth, you can put on your spiritual seatbelt because life's going to get it's going to get exciting for you. You don't need religion that that hides it. Somebody says, "But well, brother Rick, if you tell me that there's no penalty for my sin that I've got to pay, I, I won't. What's going to stop me from keeping on in sin? You're going to do that anyway. The penalty of sin never did stop you from sin." It just diverted you into other ones. The cross liberates you, sets you free. And having the love of God, the grace of God, comprehended in your mind how much He loves you and how He values you and how dear you are to Him, that will transform everything about your thinking. You can trust God's grace to do it. We've got to go. Thanks for being with us. Till next time, Maranatha.